Good evening, everyone. My name is Peter Kariva, and I'm the CEO and President of the Aquarium of Pacific. And tonight we have the first of a new series. It's a new monthly series, our first Wednesday, Wednesdays. So this is the first, first Wednesday. And uh, to kick, our sponsors are Gazette Newspapers at Courtyard Marriott. We're grateful for them giving the resources to put this on. And to really kick this off right, we have two of our own husbandry staff and they're going to be talking about penguins and who cannot love penguins. Um, the first speaker will be Rob Mortensen. Rob has been at the aquarium a long, long time, since before time began almost. Uh, he's the assistant curator of birds and mammals, been a zookeeper at uh, Santa Barbara. He was an attack helicopter crew chief in the Army. He's the most interesting man alive. Um, the second uh, speaker will be Frankie Lill, she may be the most interesting woman alive, but that's not her greatest talents. She's worked in all of the bird departments. She's really one of our great bird experts. She's also a penguin whisperer. So that every day, one of her jobs is to log how many fish each penguin eats. So think about it. That's, she's a diet coach for 22 birds, 22 penguins. Both Rob and Frankie got their degrees in zoology from Western Illinois University. That's really in the middle, well, I'm not going to say nowhere, but it's, it's in the middle of, of agricultural heartland. I can't figure out how that, that coincidence happened. I think that it's a, it's a touchdown site for um, like alien spaceships. That's the only explanation I can then figure out for how they could have both ended up here. And so first we'll hear from Rob and then from Frankie. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. Type them into the Q&A function, and uh, we'll be collecting those questions. And um, I'm sure we'll get some interesting answers as well as our talks. Thanks a lot for being here tonight. Rob? All right, thank you very much. Yeah, who knew Western Illinois was gonna be such a hotbed for a creating zoologist? I just, no idea. Apparently we were both wrong there, though. You're right. Penguins are pretty fascinating animals. They hold a fascination for the public, um, the keepers, the media, a lot of different organizations just love penguins. And I'm not sure what it is that we love about penguins. Uh, maybe it's the tuxedo-like coloration, the way they walk, the relationships that they form. Uh, maybe it's the way that they're represented in movies. You know, they're great, great animals um, because of the habitat they live in. It's very unique, very few animals can actually survive in a habitat like penguins can. And penguins are found in a lot of different types of habitats, which a lot of people wouldn't think. We always think of them as being just on snow or on ice. But it, it, can, it can vary quite a bit. It can be rocky like this. Uh, the coloration's fantastic. Like, what's there not to like about a penguin's coloration? Uh, you couldn't do it any better. And then, of course, the media loves penguins. So there's lots of different movies and books and TV shows that have all been written about penguins, wrote about penguins, and uh, they're just fantastic. And it just keeps on going year after year. Now, the coloration is very unique, and we might think that they were made there for our enjoyment, but the coloration is actually very functional, too. It's called countershading, and the black back and the white belly helps them to camouflage, which is really important, particularly when they're swimming. It's a very important feature, and a lot of animals share it. It's not unique to penguins, um, but penguins really wear it well. Penguins are pretty cool. Most people think that. I think that as well. But I'm going to tell you why they're cool beyond those things we just talked about. What really makes them biologically cool or habitat cool? So before we dive in here, pardon the pun, I, I like puns, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about penguins their origins, their lifestyles. We're going to talk about the aquarium-specific penguin. That's where Frankie's going to come in here. She's going to be our expert on those guys. Now, I love geology. Like Geology is one of my favorite things in the world. Glaciers, rock hammers, maps. Love it. Love geology. So, I, of course, I found a way to put geology in my penguin presentation. So, you might wonder how. Well, it's pretty simple. Fossils. So the oldest penguin fossils come from New Zealand. And these fossils are old, 50 million years, 60 million years old, there were penguins. There were about 50 different species of penguins that were found fossilized in New Zealand. We'll talk a little bit about how that happened and why New Zealand became such a hotbed for penguins in just a few minutes. Um, 
the oldest penguin fossils, as I was explaining, do come from this area, and that is for a particular reason, and it has to do with the continents breaking up. And I'm going to discuss that a little bit more as we go. But I wanted to tell you something. Penguins are fairly old as a group. People don't realize how old they are. We think of them as being a more modern invention, if you will. And uh, they are, they are, compared to the age of the Earth. But dinosaurs died out about 65 million years ago. Penguins weren't too far from arriving in the holes. Sorry, geology joke. They weren't too far in filling some of the holes that the dinosaurs left. Now, Triceratops here was one of the last dinosaurs on Earth, and it was a widespread dinosaur. It died out about 65 million years ago. I'm sorry, about 65, 63 million years ago. And penguins showed up about 60 million years ago, so not too much thereafter. But plants and animals back in the day had evolved to fill these holes that were left by this enormous loss of biomass with the dinosaurs, the flying reptiles, the swimming reptiles. And they had to do it as the continents were breaking up. Pangaea was breaking up into multiple, multiple continents. So animals either had to be on those continents already as they drifted away, or they had to fly or swim to get there. Penguins were in a unique position being already in the New Zealand area when it did break away and broke away from Australia as well, they were already there and they were already evolving. Some of the penguins in New Zealand were enormous. So this one here is about a five foot seven example of one of these giant penguins. This was almost a hundred pound animal that lived back in the day. And we're pretty typically used to the fact that penguins and dinosaurs and mammals were bigger and bigger and bigger. That was the natural trend. Nowadays, they're a little bit smaller, but we do have some fairly big penguins on the planet still. And they've radiated. Penguins are all over the place. So if you look at the southern hemisphere, which this map is actually tilted to show you Antarctica proper right in the center, and then the other continents around the side, you can see the red ring or orange that represents all the different areas that penguins have colonized. They're in South America. They're in Antarctica proper. They're in all the islands, the southern tip of Africa. Australia, and our good old friend, New Zealand. Let me start off with the emperor penguin. It's, it's iconic. It's probably the one that's given popularity to a lot of other penguin species. The thing that makes emperor penguins so impressive is the journey that they make in order to reproduce. These animals walk immense distances inland in Antarctica for protection. They also do it in winter, the coldest, most brutal time that these animals move into that area. The males stay with the eggs after the female lays the eggs and heads back out to sea for two months. That's two months of egg duty, sitting with an egg on their feet, single egg, and the dad doesn't eat. Has to wait for the mom to come back. She takes over the chick raising duties once that happens, and then he can finally go out to the ocean to start hunting again. It's a pretty cool life story. It's a pretty big penguin. These guys are over four feet tall, about 60 pounds, sometimes 80 pounds. They can be very large animals. Since we're in Antarctica, though, I want to talk to you about another penguin. This is one of my favorites. This is the Adeli penguin. They're very distinctive. You can see that they've got the all-black head. That's unique for penguins. It doesn't sound unique because we always think of penguins as being black and white animals. And for the most part, they are. But almost all the penguin species have some kind of markings on their head. Orange, yellow, crested feathers, not Adelis. They have the black head, very distinctive. Adelis and emperors I lumped here because they're the two species that actually breed all the time in Antarctica. These guys breed in a different season, though. They don't wait to that harsh winter time to breed. These guys actually breed when it's springtime. And they don't breed on the snow and the ice the way that the emperor penguin does. These guys actually breed on rocks and twigs, and other bare ground. If they can find an area without snow on it, that's the preferred habitat for the Adelis. Our next group. These are the crested penguins. This is your rock hoppers, your macaronis, and these are royal penguins here. These are ones you don't see too often. These guys are pretty neat. The rock hoppers, as you might expect, they hop on rocks. They're very athletic for a penguin. And they live in several groups when you find them out there. Sometimes you'll find them cohabitating. And that's led to some questions about, well, how many species of penguins are there? And it depends on who you ask. There could be 17 to 21 different species of penguins. Since we've been doing genetic work on penguins now, we know a little bit more about them. We know that the penguins have some certain characteristics genetically that maybe lead them to be other species of penguins too. So we're still kind of undecided. Now rockhoppers, um, 
the distinctive trait of hopping on rocks, as you would expect. The royal penguins don't necessarily do that, but what's pretty cool about these guys, these form enormous colonies. 500,000 royal penguins can be found in some of the colonies off of New Zealand and Australia. Finally, I wanna talk about a couple other groups here. These are my favorites. These are little fairy blue penguins, or the little penguins, or the little blue penguins. They have a couple of different names, and it depends whether or not you're a kiwi or whether you're a wallaby. If you know rugby, you'll know what I'm talking about there. These guys are adorable. These guys are about a foot tall, weigh under three pounds, and they're blue. So what more can you ask for for a penguin? And then we're gonna turn it over and talk a little bit more about the temper group. And I'm getting ready to segue over here to Frankie. She's gonna tell you a lot about the temper penguins and particularly our Magellanic penguins. The temper group of penguins though includes four species. And I'm not gonna steal your thunder here, Frankie, but there's Africans, there's Humboldt's, and one of the ones I wanted to talk about was the Galapagos penguin. And in particular, because the Galapagos penguin can actually occur north of the equator. When we think of penguins, we always think of penguins as being a strictly southern hemisphere species or group of animals. That's not entirely true. One little group that just gets across the equator, so I'll say that's your, your northern hemisphere penguin. With that, hopefully you've learned a little bit more. I'm gonna turn it over to Frankie. He's gonna tell you all about Magellanic penguins. All righty. Thank you, Rob. So I am going to touch a little bit on the other type of banded species penguins. So Rob did just mention our Magellanics, which we have here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. There is also Humboldt, Galapagos, and African. So Magellanic penguins can be found off the coast of Chile and Argentina. And the largest group of colony of them actually exists on the Falkland Islands, which they do interject, intercept with different types of penguin species there, but there are hundreds of thousands of Magellanic penguins that do live on that island. And then if you take a look at the red line along Chile and Argentina, they can be found off the coast all the way down the length of those two countries. And there are nearly two million breeding pairs of Magellanic penguins, and these numbers don't include the juveniles that are not breeding. So there are several million Magellanic penguins out they're doing their thing in Chile and Argentina. Then we have our African penguins, which have less than 25,000 pairs, Humboldt penguins that have roughly 12,000 pairs, and the Galapagos penguins that have fewer than 600 breeding pairs. So if you take a look at these three species, they look pretty similar. They have the one banded stripe across their chest. They have a black face with some white around it, and the Galapagos are a little bit more extreme. And I'm gonna go right back over to Paddles here. She's one of our very own. You can see she actually has two bands on her chest. So they look a little bit different. The Magellanic penguins are the largest of the four species and they have the largest population. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more in a moment why they have a large population because it has a lot to do with their annual life cycle. But here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we have 22 Magellanic penguins. We have three currently that are rescued, Kate, Robbie, and Roxy. 13 of our chicks or penguins have hatched here. Paddles, Jade, Skipper, Anderson, Heidi, Lily, Matson, Astaire, Fisher, Wally, Cleo, and Dee. And lastly, Gats. And then six have transferred to the Aquarium of the Pacific. Most came to us when we opened back in 2011 when our habitat opened. And Admiral Fancy Pants came along the way in 2015 or 16 and he joined our colony. But the main reason that there are over 2 million Magellanic penguins to the 25,000 or even 600 breeding pairs has a lot to do with what the Magellanic penguin life cycle looks like. They have a very intentional breeding season where the other three will breed throughout the year, including during their annual molt. And molting is a pretty stressful time and it just interferes with breeding and being able to raise your young. So I made a little chart here so you can kind of see what the Magellanic penguins go through. And here we have Matson displaying our annual catastrophic molts. And then the whole colony during migration, which this is when they're in the water and swimming. And then breeding season, this is Skipper and Jade in their burrow. And I'm gonna go into some detail with each of these three major seasons that these birds will go through. And first I'm gonna talk about molt. I like to talk about molt first because to me it feels like I can go full circle, even though I guess I could start at any single one of those. But molting is the, the time of year where 
they will replace all their feathers. So if you think about the word molt, it can be applied for a lot of animals. Molting is when an animal will shed their fur, feathers, or skin in order to replace that fur, feather, or skin. And since penguins are birds, they are replacing their feathers. So molting is different for different kinds of animals. So some birds, if you've been to the Aquarium of the Pacific, we have lorikeets. They are parrots that will molt one feather at a time throughout the year to maintain their perfect plumage so that they can fly and be in the rainforest and do their bird thing. But Magellanic penguins will actually molt out all of their feathers in a three to five day period. So you can kind of see a lot of variety in these penguins I've got on the screen here. A couple are mostly done with their molts. Some, one of them in the middle there, he's super expanded, only lost a couple of feathers. You can see the detail in between the different extremes of molt. So they will actually bulk up for their molt. So they are eating a ton of food so they can get as large as possible. And for some of them double in weight because when they are molting, they do not have access to food because when they molt, they are no longer waterproof. And if they are not waterproof, they cannot swim and therefore they cannot hunt for their food, which is primarily fish. So they bulk up for that season so that when they are on land, they have energy to live off of. So they've got a ton of calories in their body that they are just taking in, utilizing while they are growing in their new feathers. So they push out all of those old feathers and then they have the new tiny feathers. If you look on the far right of the screen, you can see the penguin whose head is the only thing left. You can see the tiny little specks of new feathers growing in and those feathers are not waterproof yet. So Magellanic penguins, like most birds, have a uropygial gland, which is a preen gland, or even if you want to think about it, it's an oil gland. And that oil is actually what makes those feathers waterproof. So they spend four to six weeks on land preening those feathers, maintaining them and re-waterproofing them with oil. So they're taking their beak and their flipper, sometimes their foot doing penguin yoga, and they are just getting themselves nice and waterproof so that they can go to their next season, which is migration. So migration season is pretty lengthy. Other banded penguin species don't have to have a migration season because the Galapagos penguins live on an island, so they can just go find their food and go right back home that day. African penguins live on the south, um, the south end of South Africa, so they're able to go out to the islands and come back home. And then same exact thing for Humboldt's. They kind of stay near where they are normally at each season, but Magellanic penguins end up needing to follow their food source. So they have intentionally molted out all of their feathers at the same time so they can be perfectly waterproof for their migration season, where they will be swimming for three to four months long at sea, or some, someone did the math at some point in time, around 2,500 miles they are swimming during their migration season. Now here in the Northern Hemisphere, that migration season is November through February, so we're actually kind of exiting our migration right now. But in the Southern Hemisphere, that's the, that's the June through September months, because if you think about it, they're flipped. They also have very heightened senses. This is a spooky time for our penguins. And you see it here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. The penguins are just very aware of their surroundings. They're a little flighty, which is funny because they don't fly, and they will react. So if it's a windy day and something's moving and makes a sound, odds are the penguins are in the water faster than you can figure out why. If I accidentally drop something, like a marker, because I'm writing down all those fish they eat every day, they'll go into the water. So they are very aware of their surroundings because they need to be able to flee. Their predators are the most intense when they're in migration season because they have sharks, orcas, and seals, and sea lions that are coming after them. Where on land, they don't have as intense of predators. So they need to be ready to just move because if they're not perfectly waterproof and they're not reacting to their surroundings, they are vulnerable and that particular penguin might not survive. And I mentioned this, they are just following their food source. So as the temperatures are colder because it's their winter season, so the fish are moving as well, so they're following that food. And then next up we have breeding season. This picture is taken off of our explore.org camera, but what you can see on it are nine holes. So we have nine burrows or nest boxes available to all of our penguins. And these are spaces where our, our mated pairs are able to go into the burrow. 
And we are gearing up for that right now. So this picture here, you can see a different angle of the burrows. I actually took this picture today before the rain. Maybe it was after the rain, anyway. So you can see one, two, three, four burrows that are open and one that is closed. And the open burrows are ready for the penguins to start establishing where or who's gonna get what burrow or how they're gonna make their move. And then at that point, the male usually comes out of water from that migration season two to three weeks before the female so that they can prepare the nest for their, their mates. And basically the penguins will collect any type of substrate, rocks, sticks, grasses, and they are a burrowing species, so they kind of move around the rocks that they're using and then end up ultimately creating a little space for where they will lay their egg. So here at the aquarium, we do offer sanitized materials such as palm fronds or other plants we may have on the grounds that can act as that same type of material for them. And then behind the scenes, we actually have large dog kennels where they are building these kennels. I'm sorry, they're building these nests. So once they are ready to, they have their nest made, they're ready to go, these penguins will mate for life. So they, and of course, if they lose a mate over time, they will find a new mate and they will both take care of the egg. So once the female lays the egg, both of them will take care of it. One bird on the nest while the other one's hunting for food and then they'll, they'll flip flop. And if and when a chick hatches about 40 days later, both parents will take part in feeding and raising their young. And then at 60 to 80 days old, that chick is full size and um, they look a little different. So here I've got some photos for you. The one on the bottom right is a baby penguin. I'm not sure which penguin it is, but it is one that we raised here at the aquarium and they are very tiny. The egg is only the size of my palm, so that's a little bit bigger than that. And then the next one, that is Fisher and Astaire, who are some of our four-year-old penguins, and they are several weeks old, and they are rapidly growing. And then on the far left, we have a juvenile penguin. So that penguin will look like that with the white front and a silver backside for an entire year. So while the parents go off to go molt, they'll go into their annual catastrophic molt, the young actually spend that first year just figuring out how to be alive. <laughs> They're just figuring out if they can make it through that first year while finding food for themselves, protecting themselves, maintaining their scenario, whatever they may be doing. They'll molt a whole year later. So that is a little bit about breeding season. I, I, there's probably a lot of details I'm skipping out on, but here at the aquarium, we have many burrows and we have several pairs that, will, that have raised penguins. We've raised 13 chicks since we opened back in 2011 and, and most likely plan to raise more in the future. And I'm gonna wrap up the, the annual life cycle and then talk about a species survival plan. So just to kind of show you that cycle again, they'll go through their annual catastrophic molt into their migration and then breeding season. But there is some fun stuff that happens between the seasons. They're very hormonal when they're going in and out of these seasons. There's a lot of stress and stress <laughs> releasers that happen. So they actually are very playful and loud and fun. And in this picture, you should imagine that all of them are calling with their loud donkey-like bray you can see some of them in their poses. This is a fun time, they're very social, and that's actually something that we're experiencing right now if you were to watch our habitat on explore.org or even came to visit the aquarium because this is one of our outdoor habitats. But now I'm gonna move into our species survival plan. As the Association of Zoos and Aquariums states, they are led by expert advisors who cooperatively work together to maximize genetic diversity. They appropriately manage the demographic distribution and long-term sustainability of the TAG recommended animal programs within the institutions. So basically that just means that these are programs that aid in the longevity of an animal within zoos and aquariums. There are programs that help an animal be raised and then released back into the wild, but not a species survival plan. This plan is just helping us maximize our, our colony, and not just ours, but all of the institutions that have, say, Magellanic penguins, we're all working together to make sure that our genetics remain varied for as long as possible. 
So we have those three Brazilian rescues who have participated in that program just by laying eggs and raising their young and providing new genetics. And now I am going to jump into some conservation efforts that we've been a part of relating specifically to penguins. Back in 2001 or 2002, there was a major oil spill in South Africa. So you can see that picture on the left where there are, I think, around 20,000 African penguins that were affected by the treasure oil spill. And people came in from all over the world. And fortunately, the Aquarium of the Pacific was able to send one of our very own keepers to help aid that process. And she was there for many, many weeks long, long hours, and by doing that, she was able to gain experience and able to pass that on to other team members. And recently, we were able to send someone back to Africa where they helped raising chicks that were abandoned by their parents and ultimately releasing them. But right now, there aren't any major penguin scenarios, which is wonderful, but we are still keeping our skills ready to go. So many of us on the mammal and bird team here at the aquarium are part of the Oiled Wildlife Care Network. So what we're doing in our spare time is keeping our skills up when it comes to restraining and any medical needs and going to different training seminars. And in these photos here, we just went to our basic responder training where we learned how to put on hazmat suits. We are just prepared to react when there is a new situation, whether it's here in California or in a different in a different place, we are able to aid and assist. So we've got about five people on our team that are continuously learning more to be able to help if there is or when the next response is called. Now I've mentioned explore.org a few times and if you just find yourself needing some more penguin time, we do have lots of different webcams at the aquarium through this website, explore.org, including our Magellanic penguins. We have an above water camera and an underwater camera where you can just watch them swim and eat and hang out and even watch them at feeds. So again, if you're unable to visit us here in person or maybe you're not in California, you can watch our penguins 24 seven through our explore.org. But there's some more penguin opportunities, some that don't have to happen in person, but our in-person one is an encounter. So if you're interested in coming to the aquarium before hours and meeting a penguin, that's one of our opportunities. There are virtual Zooms, some cameos, adopt a penguin, and more if you just check out our website, aquariumofpacific.org. And I think that is all I have right now. I'm sure there are many questions, but I just wanna thank you all so much for having me and I think I'm gonna, we're gonna be ready for some questions. All right, I don't know. Uh, well, um, you know, since we talked about the genetics and maintaining the diversity and all that, one of the questions was, do uh, different penguin species ever hybridize? So is there any even, you know, molecular genetic, is there any evidence that the different species exchange have, have made hybrids in the past? There are, yes. The one that's on my mind right now has to do with the rock hopper species and the crested penguins. Although the world knows that there are 18 species of penguins, there's actually like 28 if you consider all these little subspecies that have happened. And I, I don't know of any specific scenarios with any of the banded species penguins, but Humboldt penguins and Magellanic penguins actually share a space. They both share the Falkland Islands and some of that coastline. So. Although I don't know of any personal scenarios, it, it, it probably has attempted to happen anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I just know the molecular data has revealed that species exchange DNA a lot more than anybody thought, so I wonder what that was. <laughs> yeah, I, I suspect that it's probably those two, that, if there are, because they're so similar. Right, in, yeah. In, yeah. So, uh, you know, another one for you, Frankie, um, and then we'll turn to <laughs> harassing you, Rob. But, um, <laughs> is, you know, you talked about the oil uh, as being a threat. How about climate change? Is there, is it, you know? Yeah, Because the yes. fi fish are, is, what's climate change doing to penguins? I have two answers, and Rob, if you have more, please add. So the main one is, that's affecting Magellanic penguins, is the weather. So the rainy season is now extending into the breeding season, and these downy chicks that are not waterproof are having issues with hypothermia. So they are, that is one of the main reasons of decline for Magellanic penguins. 
And then the food source, as waters get warmer, the more nutritious fish that live in colder waters are leaving. So they're not getting as much nutrition and calories that they may have gotten when the water temperature was how it was prior. So the colder fish are, are moving on, which have more nutrients and more calories, and the warmer fish are coming in and they're not as right. energy filling. <laughs> so they're both getting sort of directly stressed by the climate and also yeah. food stressed by the climate change. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'll add to that too in that uh, there's, there's good news slash bad news, and I'll use the Antarctic penguins as an example. For the emperor penguins, bad news, because more of the ice shelf is uh, retreating, and so they have to walk even further mm -hmm. and use a, a more caloric demand on their body to get to good breeding grounds. But for penguins like the Adelie, which are looking for more exposed space, they're actually finding more nesting space now as time goes on. And Rob, you know, you showed those maps uh, of the, you know, of the continents breaking apart, and then also the distribution, you know, with the red outline. So, so to, how, how did penguins, I mean, how, how did they move all over the world? And now, is the, like, are, is their range changing, or is, is that map that you, you know, that map that outlined their range, hmm. has that been pretty constant for the last, you know? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about such a large expanse of time that's almost unfathomable right. for us, but they expanded from some common stock, uh, originally probably in the New Zealand area to all these various islands by island hopping basically. We don't know, to answer your first part of the question, what that'll do long term. I think some animals will take advantage of some coastlines that weren't available to them before and we'll see some expansion, but we'll also see some retraction in species as well that are gonna be more um, restricted to where they can breed. And, and it's really the breeding sites that are gonna be the big limiting factor. Are, are there any species of penguins that are, I don't know the, the classification system, but are there any that are really at an incredibly high risk of extinction? I know there's threatened and declining, but, it, but you know what I mean? That like whatever the IUCN category, is, whatever the category is of the highest risk, are there, are there any species of penguin in that? Definitely the Galapagos penguins are, I mean, there's, there's less than 2,000 right. total. And then one of the those little subspecies of those crested penguins, yeah. there's less than a hundred of a couple of those, but they're kind of rare and one-off. They're random, which is why they never get talked about a lot, but they live in such a small area. So yes, but it's not really talked about as much with those because the world doesn't know there's more than 17 species of penguins. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think one of the things that's, um, that's a good marker for that when you have an animal that you're concerned for is the, the rapid rate that their numbers are falling. Right. I think African penguins have fallen at a very steep rate comparatively to other species. I got a lot of questions here. <laughs> uh, can any penguins fly at all, even just for a short period? Through the water? No, they're all too heavy and they have very, very excellent swimming skills. <laughs> Yeah. They, they, uh, there's a caloric cost to being able to swim and fly, so ox are a good example of that. But the cost is astronomical to them when they're flying, so they've done a bunch of research to find out the energy cost for them. And penguins um, eventually went away from that, and they became larger boned, thicker boned, thicker muscle attachments, excellent for swimming, completely non-functional for flying. And, um you know, when you were talking about what we the breeding and um, uh, what we do with the penguins, but I think this question is sort of put simply, what, what does the aquarium do with surplus birds? Yeah, we have, uh, over the years, we've been able to work with other facilities and send birds for, it's always been breeding programs. So they've always had an intentional place to go with an intended mate waiting for them. So a couple of years ago when we received Admiral Fancy Pants, it was for breeding purposes and we've sent, I think two or three birds to other institutions. So we don't, surplus is kind of a strange, strange, it's words, a strange way to I, think yeah, about yeah, it, yeah, but yeah, we fun. do do it and it's all in efforts and maintaining the longevity of the genetics and just the animals within AZA. Um, so I was curious about where is the Penguin genetic research being done. Do you know, do you know where that? Uh, I, I, you know, I actually learned a lot by by studying up for this. And there's a lot of different universities, some in Canada, which is ironic to me that it couldn't be any further away from penguin grounds. Right, right. Um, I believe it was a, a university in Quebec that was doing a lot of the genetic research on these. 
There was also one in Britain as well, so kind of all over the world. Uh, what, what do we feed the penguins? Wow, I just skipped right over that one. We feed two different types of fish primarily, so herring and capelin, and they are sustainable seafood that we get through various vendors. And then every once in a while, they have a enrichment source of live sardines. Oh. And that's pretty fun to watch, but they don't always know what they're doing. <laughs> they're not fussy eaters? They'll, they'll eat anything? Are they fussy eaters? Uh, and yes. Oh, they are. <laughs> they like their fish to be faced in a very perfect direction. And whatever, she's one of our penguins. Her name's whatever. She for a long time only took her capelin in a very specific like angle. We're working on it, but she, she now takes fish normally. They're funny, <laughs> they're all goofy. <laughs> so does the, yeah, this is really a question about the fossil record of penguins. What, what are sort of the, the major, if any, physical changes that have happened over the Time scale you geologists like to think about. Yeah, it, you know, like I said, going back to those those early penguins, you know, 60 million years ago, they didn't look like penguins today. They were they were much more similar to a um, oh not not an auk. That's not a, a fair thing. More like a uh, a booby or uh, an albatross type of a bird with a different style of beak, um, designed probably for spearing more than catching like our modern day penguins do. And then over time, you can see in the fossil record that that anatomy changed. Some of the things that, that also changed, presuming that some penguins, at least the stem penguins, could actually fly, were the, the broadening of the scapula for the muscle attachments mm -hmm. to make them more powerful swimmers. And then the bones aren't hollow like a, a flighted bird's bones are. They're flattened, they're broader, they're fused in some cases, much more efficient for a swimming animal than for a flying animal or even like our puffins which do a little bit of both, but don't do any of them very well. So what happened to those, you know, the giant penguins you showed? Did they get, just get wiped out by humans or, was, or is it something else? Yeah, no, they weren't, they weren't part of any of the, the major extinction plants. Right, it right. was just kind of a gradual phase out for those. Uh, probably New Zealand is, is very unique, just like Australia is in that a lot of flightless birds actually adapted in that area and there's still a bunch of them there today. And uh, that just happened to do with predation, that without the lack of or with the lack of predators there, you saw some different evolutionary trends, including in the penguins. Oh, wow, these are good questions. <laughs> this one I like. Uh, so how could kids help penguin <laughs> conservation efforts? Oh, that's a good question. Let's see. Well, a lot of conservation efforts do really stem back to how can you help your environment, your current immediate surroundings, but just getting involved and helping educate. One of the opportunities we have at the Aquarium of the Pacific is family volunteers and a, the ability for teenagers to come in and, and learn and educate themselves and then educate others on what you can do. A lot of programs to physically be in the field and start assisting and helping do happen at the age of 18, but really getting your foot in the door to learn how to be in this environment is helpful and just learning about what a penguin is, where do they live, what do we need to help preserve their habitat. It's kind of a related one. Can you talk about the penguin enrichment field trips at the aquarium of the Pacific? Penguin enrichment field trips. I am actually not familiar with that, but I can talk about penguin enrichment that we do here at the aquarium. Right. So we offer a couple of different things. For starters, enrichment is just any way to stimulate their minds. So we can, we can say any way, anywhere from being able to give them waves or a surge in the habitat to bubbles. So they can meet new people, they, can, they have reflective surfaces that they really enjoy, like maybe a laser pointer or even just your watch in the sunlight or different types of toys that they play with in the water, walking around the aquarium. There's many different enrichment items. So I'm wondering if that is more, if someone has seen us playing with the balls in the water or Seasonally, we'll put pumpkins in or we'll decorate stockings for them to change their environment. I'm not positive what the, yeah. you, are you familiar with that? No, but I was gonna make up something. Oh, okay. Oh, good. <laughs> we can do a field trip for that. Yeah. I know, I, 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 that would be fun. <laughs> yeah, what you talk about, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with, uh, like even salmon, when you put them in hatcheries for release, you do enrichment because otherwise their brain's not developed enough mm -hmm. for them to survive when they get out. So it's, I didn't realize we did that here. That, uh, yeah. yeah, you know what, now that I think about it, I wonder if it just means the 
field, it's the penguins that are going on the field trip throughout the aquarium, not right. that people ah, are coming okay. to a field trip. <laughs> um, are the little blue penguins in danger? So you got somebody really yeah, interested they're, in those. They're, they're certainly declining. Uh, the question was, are little blue penguins endangered? Uh, I don't think that they're listed as endangered. I believe they're listed as threatened, but I'd have mm -hmm. to double check that. They, they certainly are at risk though, and a lot of that risk comes from introduced species in their case. Mm -hmm. They're in an area that does have um, a potential for introduced species, dogs, cats, rats even, um, and they're so small that they're susceptible to just about everything. And I didn't mention in my presentation, but one of the things that I think is pretty cool about little blue penguins, they're nocturnal. And they're nocturnal huh. for a reason. It actually helps them to avoid some of the predators that would otherwise be able to capture them. So they live in burrows by day and then they come out at night to forage. Yeah, I have to, I have to tell you, you, you were talking about the giant colonies um, in Patagonia of the, of the large populations of the giant yeah. penguins. The, the royal I have penguins. field biologists that claim that it's because we wiped out pumas. Mm -hmm. I actually heard that recently and I was like, yeah, so. So I guess there's, the pumas are back. Yeah, and the pumas are coming back. That's the, yeah. So now we should be worried about the penguins or be happy for the pumas, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's getting it in the right balance. <laughs> so this is a good one. I, 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 are all the burrows open and will you take some of the coverings, uh, penguins off exhibit if several want the same burrow? So like, it's sort of like, is, is there like this competition and yeah. I mean, how do you handle it? So last year we did take a couple of birds off habitat for the entire breeding season because we have some adolescent birds that are not so adolescent. And we're actually working through some plans right now to make sure that all of our birds have a space that they want to go through this year, because this is the first time in our history that we didn't, that we have an entire colony that are sexually mature and whether they have a mate or not, they definitely want a space. So we are working through a couple of different plans right now and we'll probably start acting on those soon. So. Mm -hmm be expecting an update or just visually i'm sure you'll see some things online so how how long uh do penguins breathe, breathe and stay how long do they stay underwater when you, you know you show them when they're doing this migration how long could they stay underwater just a couple of a couple of moments really they don't stay under very long i think one to two minutes is is long for them so so when they're when they're doing this migration it's um they're at the surface a lot surface they level they do lots of porpoising yeah. And they're just in, I, I wish, I hope one day I can see it with my own eyes, but to my knowledge, it's just a wave of birds, thousands and thousands of them swimming together. I think a, an emperor penguin now holds the record for a recorded scientific dive, and it was 30 minutes. So they are capable of diving deeper and holding their breath for some species, but uh, that's not the norm. Yeah, this is a... Um yeah, this is a good... What is penguin social structure like? And you talked about... Um you know, basically mate for life, but is there, is there a, a variety of social structures of the different species or what's the range of the different sort of social structures? The, the mate for life thing isn't, isn't common for all the species. Okay. The Magellanics are one of the unique ones that are mates for life, but as far as social structures go, there's no, there's no alpha in, but there are territories. So if you, if you enter a territory, you, you should know you're going to, you're going to duke it out, fight for that space. But other penguins like emperor penguins they'll they'll mate with one female and then find a new mate the males will find a new female the next season they don't they don't rely on any sort of individual calls year after year to come back to each other and again each each species i can't think of any specific hierarchy other than you're near my home go away or face my fist there, there, you're right, and there, there certainly are with the emperors, where the the bigger, more dominant pairs will set up territory in the middle of the colony, which tends oh, to be a little fair. bit safer. Right, right. So when you've got some predators coming in, mostly it's airborne predators in that case, um, the penguin chicks and eggs that are on the outside of the colony are certainly more vulnerable. So, so this is not this is uh, you know, my question, not somebody else's, <laughs> but um, like, what's their juvenile mort mortality like? So, so what's what fraction? of the eggs survive to be able to reproduce? Uh, like in nature or even in, you know, what fraction of... Yeah, of I, I, honestly, I'd be hazarding a guess, and I suspect it's different for all the different species of penguins. Mm -hmm. I think emperor penguins are probably um, the most known uh, species, and I, I, do you know the number on that? 
I, I feel like 5%. So there's a lot of eggs. A lot of penguins will hatch two eggs right. in hopes that one survives and one get makes it yeah. through. It seems like they're so vulnerable, you know, yeah. that's why I asked that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a vulnerable way of, of breeding and being on the ground in general puts them at risk. So you're right, for the, the birds that raise two, a lot of times it's 50-50 it's whether or not you're going to get two um, successful hatchlings all the way up to adulthood. Emperors put a lot of calories into one um, right. to manage it for that immense amount of time that they have. So I think their success rate is, is fairly high, but that's the cost of walking all the way inland to get away from the, uh, the seaborne predators. And how old are penguins when they become sexually active? And I want to add to that, how long do penguins live? So... In an environment like a zoo and aquarium, they're going to become sexually active or mature a little bit earlier because they have all the nutrients and food and resources and less stress. So around three years old. In the wild, it might be five or six years old just to make sure that they're fully where they need to be and as far as nutrients go so they can produce what they need. And then how old can they be? Also a double question. In the wild, 10 years old is pretty old. In an animal care facility with access to water, food, veterinarian, and no predators, 25 to 35 years. Look, I have uh, just we have time for the two last questions. <laughs> I like these because I can identify them with them personally. Tell us more about the sneaky behavior of GATS. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> GATS is a fan of taking his own food out of the bucket. So <laughs> every day I look, we have a comment section. So every, every time I see someone snaps a photo of Gats's face just in the bucket, he is sneaky because he is very good at it. So if I'm over here paying attention to another bird, usually he's in the bucket just grabbing a fish. So I've tried to, to beat him and put something down so that I can like, somehow he always wins. <laughs> so Gats is just a, he's a quick bird at the bucket. <laughs> and what does, you know, um, I mean, what what is your what 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 does the vet staff look for when they when they examine penguins? Like what are they what are the sort of health and medical problems that they have? And I like this question: Do penguins get arthritis? Mm. <laughs> yeah. So annually here at the aquarium, we'll do annual checks, and so long as there are no issues throughout the year, that's the only time the animal will go to the veterinarian. And they're looking for a lot of things that people are look or that people look for. So there's body condition, just making sure they're not underweight or overweight. We're checking eyes, nose, mouth for discoloration or in eyes with older animals. Thankfully, we don't have this issue. You, there could be cataracts or other things to look for or feather condition, just making sure the animals are preening. And then additionally, they get some annual vaccinations or we check their blood just to make sure their levels look okay. And yes, absolutely, as a penguin gets older, just like people, they may get arthritis or any other bone type of condition that will just. So what do you do when they're overweight? Do you cut back on their fish? We have done that, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, and this is the, the last question. Do, do um, siblings you know, from different years, do, do they know they're part of the same family? No, I don't think they do. And, and so we have two two sets of that here right now. So I think that question derives from Heidi and Anderson, who are siblings, and Dee and Gats. And they have found a liking to each other. And they don't know. They, I don't even know that they know who their parents are after about 80 days old, because in theory, their parents have left the situation and they're just fending for themselves. Uh -huh. So no, they don't know who their siblings are. OK, well, thank you guys very much. <laughs> uh, terrific information. And Wonderful passion for the animals. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And uh, audience, uh, the next first Wednesday, I don't know when that is, but a first Wednesday is easy to remember. <laughs> so the first Wednesday of April. We'll just hope it's not April Fool's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thank you. Let's see it. Great job, you guys. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, you're.